Thank you, Maureen. Everyone hear me okay at the back there? Yep, I guess not. Okay, so uh, as Maureen introduced me, I'm Brendan Slade. I'm based in San Jose, and I'm uh, director of the Horizontal Enablement Team in NXP's Secure Connected Edge business line. So my team looks after enablement related to software and tools that are broadly applicable across any application. Um, and so that's why I'm involved in Zephyr as a broad-based enablement. And today I'm going to be talking about why NXP is doubling down on Zephyr, really about our experiences since the project began and why we're stepping up our resources and our engagement on the project because of how we see the market evolving. And um, so obviously making a gambling reference here. So am I a gambler? Well, I'm really not a gambler. I should say at this point, actually, I'm going to go back. Um, I had some quite cool AI images that use me and David, uh, but then turns out uh, NXP is quite careful about things like that, and they said, you can't use any AI-generated images. So we've gone back to Shutterstock. So pictures you here, you think, well, that doesn't look much like Brendan. Like, this doesn't look much like me. That's why. Um, anyway, I'm not a gambler. I don't like gambling. I never really have. And the thought of losing lots of money that I could be spending on something else for a few moments of a thrill really doesn't appeal to me. But David, my colleague down here, he's quite different. <laughs> he's a very keen poker player. Um, and it's interesting. I talk to uh, a few people about poker and stuff. Apparently, it's very scientific these days. I always think about it in the 1970s and 80s movies growing up where it was all about steely nerve and the poker face and a bit of luck. And David tells me for him, it's kind of a combination of those things. Bit of science, bit of, uh, bit of old school. So um, gambling, well, I'm not a huge fan of gambling, but even someone like me can um, enjoy a little flutter if the odds aren't so bad. So this is a, a horse called Red Rum. Um, there's a race in the UK called the Grand National. It's run for many years. It's a very tough horse race with a lot of jumping. Uh, and it's very unknown who's going to win. It's a bit of a lottery. But this horse won the thing three times. Um, when I was a kid in the 70s, visiting Grandma, who was a bit more of a gambler, we would have a fun Saturday morning looking at all the runners and riders, picking out the ones we thought might win. And it was always a good idea to have red rum. You could get red rum and then an outsider. You, you were pretty, pretty safe in an each way bet with red rum. Even if you didn't win, you still get some money back. So even I, as a, a, a gambling phobe, can, can enjoy uh, a little gamble on something when I feel the odds are pretty good. But what has this got to do with Zephyr, I hear you say? Well, any, any kind of investment by business in a project like uh, Zephyr is a gamble. You're, you're putting resources onto something on the belief that it's going to be a good return on investment. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is how uh, we see the odds very much moving in the favor of investing more, and that's why we're doing that. And what, what exactly are we doing? So NXP was involved at the start of the Zephyr project back in 2016. And a big part of why we were doing that was some good vision from, from the leadership team at the time, that the open source software adoption, we saw that increasing in the uh, microcontroller market after obviously being so dominant in the microprocessor space. And it wasn't only an open source project, it was the fact that the, the project goals and objectives were very well aligned with NXPs. So <clears throat> the things have, have evolved somewhat since 2016, but not radically so. I think we, this is a, an extract from NXP's website looking at um, our strategic goals as a company, what we're trying to do. So we're trying to help companies be prepared for change. And uh, as the market goes towards everything being aware and connected, smart, secure, and efficient, um, we want to make sure that our customers can leverage our products to adapt with that market. Uh, Zephyr aligns very well with a connected, um, connected mu uh, product market. And it also has a big focus on security and safety. So as the project's evolving, there's more and more happening with Zephyr with security and safety as well. That's continuing to evolve and align with what NXP is doing. So NXP is quite well known as 
an uh, automotive supplier, but we've been in the general market for a long time in many, many different application spaces with tens of thousands of customers. And we have got a, uh, the, recently, just this year, we, we announced, or um, I wouldn't say re repositioned ourselves, but we announced that there's a lot more investment in the industrial side um, applications now. So this, again, reinforces our work with Zephyr as well as one of the factors leading into the extra investment in that space. So in 2016, um, I'm going to put my glass on because I can't read my speaker name. Um, we uh, came in as a platinum member, so we recognized that we needed to be committed enough to give the project a chance, right? If we didn't, didn't um, put enough behind it, there wouldn't be momentum, there wouldn't be critical mass to succeed. And so we did that and we were involved in several working groups. We gradually increased the number of resources in the team over that time to do more in the technical committees and the working groups and been contributing um, things like SDHC, DISC and so on. Some of the people who've done that are here in the, in the audience today. Um, the team also supported uh, NXP products. We did upstreaming the support. We saw some good contributions from um, others that supported some of our popular Kinetis devices, again, members in the audience who did that. And um, we focused on our IMX RT and LVT 5500 series devices because um, those were the ones most active in new designs, but we were also contributing to Kinetis parts and even some of the IMX parts as well um, were happening as well. But it was more of a, um, I wouldn't say ad hoc, but it was more of a, a background of, of adapting to what the customers were asking for and not going across our, our entire product line. Um, and we saw steadily increasing levels of interest. As there was more customers, more activity, the whole project was growing. So we saw that looking healthy and good. So that was all fine. But then there was a bit of an inflection with COVID. So suddenly um, there was obviously a massive human cost and also for industry as well. A lot of companies really struggling, going under because they just couldn't get parts. So we saw this, uh, once things had calmed down from the craziness, um, companies really looking at this supply issue. Um, it really brought that sharply into focus. There were companies playing 10, even 100 times the market price for a product which may even be a gray market product. And um, this really made companies rethink. They'd been relying on products from one particular chip from one vendor, and uh, then they were really paying the price for that. So they needed to change that so that they can adapt to different devices, and then companies really scrambling. It was very, very expensive and difficult for them to, to do that. So there was a recognition that they really needed to be able to adapt to the situation. So. The pandemic has thankfully calmed down. Um, the supply situation is pretty much back to normal. We're seeing normal lead times for semiconductors now. Um, so why are we still seeing companies making a switch to Zephyr? And obviously they haven't forgotten already about what happened with COVID, but we feel there's more forces at play here than just the supply issue. This is based on customers that, that we've worked with that have made the decision to adopt Zephyr. So my picture here is showing a, a showroom with a lot of different appliances um, of lots of different variations. So if customers we've seen in a place like a uh, space like the appliance market, um, they were using whole sets of different micros from different places, different product architectures, and uh, focused in on, on trying to uh, either there's a historical thing, there's a, um, um, a non-organic growth of their product line, or they just uh, had different groups working on different projects in different places. But we're seeing them changing to want to take the same code base and apply it across different products, even products using quite low-end microcontrollers. And to do that, they need to be able to reconfigure the uh, design very easily and move across those different platforms to move quickly without having to just throw more R&D resources at the problem. And if you're going to um, 
deliver all these products, you still have to test them, even if you can reconfigure them and build them quickly. So you have that problem to solve as well. And again, there was a lot, lot of legacy of, of test infrastructure that people were having to maintain and adapt. So um, people quite often criticize Zephyr for being complex, right? They say, oh, there's, if, if I'm from a microcontroller background, what is this device tree, this kernel config? Why do I need to know this? The build system's so complicated. Why do I need to do this? Right? Um, but what we've observed is people companies have really dug into that, looked at the bigger picture benefits, and once they've got over that learning curve, um, they can see that the transition from one product, one product they're developing to another one, is actually much simpler. Because they now they just have to change the device tree and modify the kernel config, and they can target another platform very, very quickly, versus with other RTOSs, which may be simpler to use, but when you change to a different underlying processor, you have to go in and refactor the code. So there's more risk in terms of breaking things, um, and obviously more time. And on the test side, all companies have their own test infrastructure, right? They've typically grown it in the company, and they've adapted it for what they need. But the benefit of Zephyr having um, the, the infrastructure there to detect tests and to run them in a standardized way provides that for you and you get the benefit of working with a community. So you can upgrade everything together with that community rather than having to rebuild it um, for your own personal use or as you change different platforms. So we see the customers recognizing these benefits and uh, making it a stronger case for them to adopt Zephyr. So with NXP's portfolio, we have one of our strengths is we have a very broad range of products. We have um, some very low-end flash-based micros up to very high-performance uh, crossover MCUs, and then our IMX SOCs with the Cortex-A, Cortex-M cores inside. What we see is the customers want to leverage this portfolio. They, they don't want to have, they want to have multiple sources, multiple vendor partnerships, but not too many. So they still want to try and leverage a portfolio like this. They want to be able to um, make use of new technologies it comes out, either for cost reduction purposes or for introducing new features like ML. And they want to be able to make the right energy performance trade-offs. And on the IMX side, it's quite interesting that we're seeing, um, we've been promoting the concept of moving between IMX and IMX RT for quite some time. But we're really seeing that happening now in a couple of ways. Customers have a, a microprocessor-based design, for example, like in our, um, our EVSE charging uh, solutions, we see uh, customers having an MPU-based design, but they want to cost reduce, they want a, a lower end solution, and they really want to use IMX RT for that. We see it in the appliance space as well, in smartwatches, all of these spaces where for a combination of um, cost and power, they want to make that move down to the crossover MCUs. But we also see in the IMX side, people wanting more performance. So they're actually going up from a 600 megahertz Cortex M7 up to a Cortex A because they need more performance. And by having uh, a consistent strategy with uh, our different platforms and the enablement of those platforms, it makes that transition much easier. And for People I've, uh, my background is more on the microcontroller side, but I've, I've heard several uh, anecdotal conversations about uh, Linux developers saying, oh yeah, I, I get this. It's much more familiar than a, a tr an RTOS like a ThreadX or Free RTOS and so on. So the alignment again with NXP and what Zephyr brings is a very good one because uh, uh, Zephyr really lends itself to leveraging our portfolio. So that's a, a big plus for us and for our customers. Cyber resiliency laws, right? So these, these are right now in our faces, right? So things are changing, the legislation rules. We've seen quite slow take up of security, to be honest. You'll see companies that are very much on it and have been for some time, and then other companies that kind of been running away screaming for quite a long time, but now they have to face it. Um, so obviously having a, a strategy that, that um, is going to encompass security is important and Zephyr has that. But one of the other aspects of, of this is 
is the longevity of support, and this is less obvious. Um, the legislation's requiring five years of support or the expected lifetime of the product, which could be 10 or even more years, right? So for an OEM that's been relying on an RTOS, um, a commercial RTOS or another open source one, where the destiny of that RTOS is controlled by one company or is, is small or is proprietary, that becomes a risk. Um, this isn't a criticism of those other RTOSs. There's some that have been out for a very long time and they have a, a good support model for, for uh, security and long-term support. So they do exist out there, but this is one thing we see customers concerned about, um, that they're, they're worried that the, the destiny of that RTOS company um, is, is too much out of their hands. And with the momentum and the number of companies behind Zephyr, it's a much more comfortable position to be in, to be aligned with Zephyr. So back to more of NXP's interests. So we're moving to add value um, beyond our silicon. So we do a lot of cl very clever things in our silicon, um, but we want to bring more value by uh, bringing enabling technologies to customers so they can really differentiate uh, much more quickly and effectively. So this is areas like graphics or networking or motor control and these kind of things where we can provide a lot of the building blocks that they need, which have differentiation, but not to the level that uh, the differentiation value multiplying effect for them is lower than if uh, they can just focus on their, their high-end application. And so for us, we want to offer example integrations, say combining a motor control with a networking application. We have things like that. Uh, we have a quad motor control demo that does that over a, a TSN, TSN network. So we show how to integrate those pieces together, that kind of example. And as we do more and more of these, um, we have to pick a platform. We can't just do it on all platforms all the time. That's just too much. Uh, but by building on top of Zephyr, we can much more easily adapt to a particular customer saying, oh, I love that, but I want it on this instead. So we, we can do that. The picture there is from our application code hub, which is a way to kind of sort through our, our application examples. You can filter by Zephyr. We're just starting to add Zephyr examples to this, so there aren't so many there yet, but there will be a lot more coming over the next few years. Um, and one of the other nice things, apart from the ability to be flexible and adaptable to move to different platforms, is we don't have to give up the differentiation of our underlying hardware. So there's a, another talk um, from NXP later this week by Disha Patil, uh, where she's going to be talking about an IMX RT500 and power optimization on that. And that nicely illustrates how voltage scaling on that particular product um, can be leveraged for very low power. And it also doesn't mean that that entire project is completely locked into that device. Let's get a swig of water. Okay, so I'm going to give an example here. Now, this is a, a demo that we have on, uh, on display this week at the Solutions uh, Showcase. I talked about IMX RT10XX. Well, this is an RT1060 used in this demo. We also uh, uh, have done a lot of promotion at Embedded World last week about the MCX family, the MCXN family. Um, but they're quite different architectures. So the... The RT products are based on Cortex M7. They're based on a process that doesn't support flash, but can run a lot faster. Uh, we introduced this concept, I know, I can't remember, it was about five years ago now, and it's done very well. Um, obviously, those devices rely on all off-chip and non-volatile memory, so they have a quad spy flash interface. They also have an SD-RAM interface, which is obviously not non-volatile. Um, and they have a lot of process, uh, sorry, uh, peripheral IP in common with IMX SOCs. And that's in contrast to the MCXN family, uh, which has more of a lineage from our LPC and Kinetis processors. That's where that peripheral IP comes from. It's more traditional in the sense of having an on-chip flash, uh, has great improvements in cache and other things like that to get more performance out of the core frequency and the memory. But basically, it's that kind of lineage, that kind of device. Um, so it runs, the core runs a lot slower, it's 150 megahertz versus 600 megahertz. 
uh, but it has much lower power consumption. And the MCXN family also has a neural processing unit as well for, for ML applications, obviously. So the demo that we have actually runs the same application on both of those platforms. So uh, that handsome face is Derek Snell, who will quite happily talk you through the demo later if you want to come by the solutions uh, showcase. So on the right-hand side, there is the RT1060 um, with the LCD panel mounted to it. And on the left-hand side is the MCXN board, and that's using a, a quite different kind of display. Um, the application also handles the, the portrait versus landscape orientation as well, and the, the text positioning too. So the MCXN demo leverages the NPU hardware uh, for faster inference times. So you can see the numbers on the screens if you squint a bit, um, but basically the RT1060 is running at 600 megahertz and running an ML model that's purely implemented in C. And the MCXN is using the NPU and our tools take the same tf light model and compile it down to make optimal use of the NPU. But the actual source code, again, is the same. We use a binary blob that we create, and it, that hooks in to actually run the code on the NPU. So that's how that's different. But it's still starting from the same model. And the interfaces between all these, uh, between the display and the camera, are very different on these two devices. So here's a high-level block diagram with the hyperlinks for the particular hardware, in case you're interested in following up looking more. So on the left-hand side, you see the RT1060 of our board, and it hooks up with MIPI CSI and I2C for the camera control. And the LCD has a, um, a built-in LCD interface, whereas the MCXN, um, which isn't designed as much for HMI applications as the 1060 is, but it can still do a pretty decent job with the display, uses this block called FlexIO, which is like a configurable um, logic block, if you like, so it can do a lot of different things, including drive, driving this kind of parallel display interface. And then on the camera side, um, the, the MCX also has another block called Smart DMA, which is useful for handling things like cameras and the same I2C interface. So quite different hardware configurations between those two. But if we look at the actual software stack, Everything from the kernel above is the same, so we're not changing any of that. All of the, the interfacing into the hardware is done uh, below that kernel level, so the shim drivers, these uh, translate an NXP proprietary SDK API, our MC Expresso SDK, for those who know our other software products, um, translates to the Zephyr HAL. And so this is what NXP provides, and uh, then everything below obviously is proprietary to the different platforms. But NXP is providing all that enablement for you. So we have learned some things along the way. We did actually augment the display driver so it could handle a, a, a device which has got a lot of RAM and can handle the frame buffer easily internally. That's the 1060 versus another setup with the, the MCXN where you had to break the image down into strips. But you know, it's the kind of thing you learn and you contribute back to the project. So that's what we're doing with that. But we proven that you can you can make an application like this which is uh, um, quite different in terms of underlying hardware and the acceleration capabilities run on from the same code base so I did want to mention also what we're doing around the developer experience um, so we recognize that the build system and so on can be a bit confusing for people there's a lot of different tools you need like West and um, CMake and all these other things that normally people are used to installing an IDE and it's just there, right? So we know that's a bit confusing for people who maybe don't come from a Linux background. So what we've done is we, we introduced support for, uh, well, an extension for VS Code last year, which was for, for general use, but we always had the intention of focusing on Zephyr and improving that developer experience. So that's what we're, we're doing on an ongoing basis. And we, along with this, is not on the slide here, but we have an installer. So that helps you install all the different pieces you need to make life easier. And you know, we welcome any feedback on that. We're trying to keep improving it and make it better. Um, we put quite a bit of work into our link server, which is our, our proprietary debugger um, um, GDB server and other utility that gives people an option along with the Sega, which JLink is obviously very popular 
in, in the project, so we support that as well. And our area of focus going forward is how we make things easier for people who aren't so familiar with device tree, um, where it can be error prone when you're editing a device tree and you know you can make mistakes. We're trying to figure out how, how we can make that better. So anyone's got any suggestions, you know, come and chat to us. We'd love to hear about that. Nordic's done some good things in that area too. So we're watching what they're doing, interested in what people think about that. Main point though is that we're rather than just doing platform support, the developer experience is something we see is very important as well. And we're trying to help those people ease the transition from traditional microcontroller development. Another area that, that really helps is the, uh, um, the collaboration with the project and what that brings to the customer experience. So for us, there's a debt reduction. We don't have to spend as much time working on kind of table stakes, uh, going back to a betting reference again, I guess, um, for supporting uh, important uh, stacks, but ones that aren't uh, really differentiating for us or for a competition. So we can work together to generally improve the quality of things like USB and file systems and so on. Um, but that also frees up some of the resources we would have had to put on that uh, to focus those on developing new features that are really going to help the customer and help us make the most of the hardware capabilities that we're delivering in our products. And then community support. I think I've got a long history in, in applications um, and customer experience is very important to me. And by having a community approach to this, rather than having people go to the NXP community, we send them to the Zephyr community and we answer the questions there because um, we see the, the benefit to everybody of behaving in that way. So uh, we, we really see that as a, 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 great, a great way of working and you know, we appreciate all the Zephyr members that jump in and help each other out as well. It's a, a great model and it is working, is what we see. So how is NXP doubling down? Well, um, we're moving from this kind of what you might call an incubator model where we have a, a core team that's been doing a lot on the project for some time, but supporting platforms as they could to one where Zephyr enablement is mainstream for us, meaning that all our new products coming out from the Secure Connected Edge business line will have Zephyr enablement as a standard thing. So when the product comes out, Zephyr enablement will be there or will come very soon after the product launch. You've seen it with the MCX N series. We've put a lot of promotion around that. We're upstreaming support for that right now. And we're working with Dulas, AC6, others to really provide that as a platform for people to get a low-cost board and be able to get started on that. But it won't just be that. It, we plan to do it across all our microcontrollers, apart from the very low-end ones. But even there, we're seeing customers. We didn't expect customers to want to have Zephyr enablement on the very low-end and micros, but it's happening. Um, and we're responding to customers in that way. Um, Greater investment engagement, that means more about our own organization getting trained up more, so our own FAEs uh, and um, our own systems engineering teams, but also getting more involved in the Zephyr meetups and so on. So we're going to see us doing more and more around those things. And back in the way that we, we make the sausage, the, uh, the way we typically work uh, historically has been our SDKs are developed as as these packages, these archive files, which you, uh, when we do a release every six months, we generate a package like this. And everything's kind of geared around that. We're completely reworking that. So we've had SDK being pushed out onto Zip, uh, GitHub for some time now. It's proving very popular. And we're changing things around so GitHub comes first, not last. And that's going to make everything easier to get the uh, Zephyr enablement much faster as well. So uh, that's happening right now. It takes some time to change the plumbing around to do that, but we're very actively working on that right now. So, and we're also going to see more uh, downstreaming of, of platform support. So we're very much in favor of upstreaming. That's our, our fundamental approach, but we want to downstream platform support so customers can access it earlier. But I do want to emphasize we're very much in line with an upstream support model. Um, with the IMX products, we've been doing some things a little bit more ad hoc. We're 
different groups have looked at uh, Zephyr and they've used it for various different reasons. So we have our real-time edge um, software framework, which uh, was derived from OpenIL. And uh, we're trying to have that align with, with the Zephyr the Zephyr project, the other aspects of the Zephyr project more closely. So what, what RT Edge gives you is a um, configurable multi-core framework. So it really leverages multi-core into processor communication um, with a target for industrial applications, um, a lot of networking and motor control and things like this. So we're working hard to get that better aligned so our roadmap for IMX becomes much clearer. And that's something we're working on right now. And as I mentioned in the last slide, we're we're investing a lot more in the developer experience and we're very open to hear what people have to say. Okay, so all of this, uh, coming back to the, the whole gambling thing, I feel pretty good about this. I've, I'm a real Zephyr convert. I'm probably a fanboy at this stage and um, I can sleep much better at night. I feel pretty, pretty comfortable with the bet we're making. So, uh, oh, there we go. There's my Zephyr, dreamy of Zephyr. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone for for your attention. Um, I'll be in and around uh, the different papers and the, the the solution section as well. Appreciate any feedback you guys might have. I hope you found this useful. The intention was to share our experiences uh, and um, you know where we're going and why we're going there. But we're keen to hear what you guys think as well and any points we may have missed that were really critical to you. I know I didn't say a lot about safety. That's a very big thing for us as well. I didn't focus in on safety in this, but you know, that's another important area for us too. So thanks everyone. I don't know if there's any questions. Yes. And for those watching on the live chat, uh, you can post questions, or sorry, on the live stream, you can post questions on the chat and I'll repeat the question to the speaker. Okay, thank you for your uh, presentation. So my question is, uh, how Zephyr and your portfolio of different offerings uh, coexist with all the rest, FreeRTOS, uh, ThreadX, whatever? Yeah, so we, we um, it's important to note that NXP is, is kind of neutral when it comes to an RTOS implementation. We're not going on all out Zephyr and nothing else, right? We are still providing free RTOS support because it is still the most popular RTOS in the market, right? but we see those as kind of parallel to each other. We do have commonality and we have our, our SDK that we've always had, our proprietary SDK, but our current model is we shim that to match Zephyr. So that remains a common piece and we, re we continue to support um, uh, free RTOS as well. When it comes to other RTOSes, we, uh, we would tend to leave those to the community to support them. We have various degrees of involvement with them. Um, our, our main focus is on Zephyr enablement, free RTOS enablement. Okay, thank you. Still too early in the morning. Not enough coffee yet, right? We do not have any questions in the chat. So thank you, okay. Brendan. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.